Harvard Divinity School. Technosis Today, April 13th, 2022. Good afternoon and welcome to our Nosiologies event. My name is Giovanna Parmigiani and I'm the host of this series organized within the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative at the CSWR here at Harvard University. This series focuses on ways of knowing that are often labeled as non-rational, traditionally referred to as gnosis in Western philosophical and religious traditions, and often understood in contraposition to science. These ways of knowing are becoming more and more influential in contemporary societies, popular culture, and academic research. Going beyond dichotomies such as body and mind, ordinary and extraordinary, reason and experience, and matter and spirit. This series hosts scholars of different disciplines and practitioners interested in exploring and expanding the boundaries of what counts as knowledge today. Today for our last event of this academic year, I'm joined by one of my students, Joel Tapask. Joel is a second year Master of Divinity candidate at Harvard Divinity School where she studies religion, technology and visual culture with an emphasis on consciousness and the implications of artificial intelligence. Currently, she is a research assistant at the Center for Minor Culture at Boston University, where she is helping classify hundreds of religions as spiritual archival narratives to teach an AI about religion. She holds an interdisciplinary BNA, BA from NYU on art practice and as political play, and has maintained an online visual journal as her quote unquote cyber feminist living room since 2013. And you can find the link to this in the chat box. Thank you, Joel, for being here with us today. So it is with immense pleasure that I introduce today's guest, Dr. Eric Davis. Uh, Dr. Davis studied literature and philosophy at Hill University and holds a PhD in religious studies from Rice University where he concentrated on Gnosticism, Esotericism, and Mysticism. Eric is the author of five books, High Weirdness, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experiences in the 1970s, Nomad Codes, Adventures in Modern Esoterica, The Visionary State, A Journey Through California's Spiritual Landscape, uh, Led Zeppelin IV, and the book we will discuss today, Technosis. This latter is maybe the best known book by Eric, a cult classic on, of visionary media studies that has been translated into five languages and most recently republished by North Atlantic Press. Dr. Davis has widely published on art, music, technoculture, and contemporary spirituality. And he currently writes the Substack publication, Burning Shore, you can find the link to the website in the chat box. So thank you, Dr. Davis, for being with us today and welcome again to HDS. Um, Joel and I, um, and I know many of the HDS students actually are fan of your work and we are all very excited to have you here. Yeah, you guys are doing great stuff over there. I mean, thank you, you know, Dr. Parmigiani and, and the whole CSWR crew. I've already been involved with some of the other events and, uh, you know, I, I know some, a number of the people who are studying there. It's like a great program. I'm envious. Uh, jo Joel, I hope you're having a good time. And thank you for showing up as well. Uh, I look forward to, to talking to everybody about this, uh, this, still, this still living technostic uh, transmission that I, that I received in the Exactly. In the 90s, you know. So it was 1998. I was probably uh, getting my driving license. Joel was probably finishing late elementary school. Late elementary school. There you go. And you published this book that is so current and still so mm -hmm. meaningful for us today, Technosis. So can you give us a brief overview of the book? What do you mean by Technosis? what you think are the main points of the book, the journey that brought you there, um, something like that, so that, you know, we will be all on the same pages. At, oh, sure. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I mean, it's, it's, it blows my mind that it's still, in, it's still in print, and more than that, that it's still as relevant as it is, or people find re relevance in it and resonance in it. Um, I was certainly not attempting to write something, and, and given how dated 
can become. And the fact that I wrote it in the late 90s, which was the, the, the era of the first great internet boom, when techno utopianism was was rampant. Um, uh, I was I was impressed with how how pessimistic I was in a way that allows the book to be more readable today um, in a way that other writings from the 90s don't really don't really work. Not that I was just pessimistic, but, but my whole approach was to actually not really resolve the problem, but kind of like open it up and to say, um, really to just look at the religious, spiritual and occult or mystical dimension of technology, but particularly communications technology. And that's really the key is that it's not about technology in general, so much as the fact that all of our communications uh, devices, all the media we use, to some extent, including speech and language itself, but I don't get into that issue uh, too much directly, but all of the physical machinery that we use to communicate, to store information, to distribute information, to interpret information, all of that is, all, that's technology already. The book is already technology. The scroll is already technology. And that's a certain kind of media studies approach that I imbibed through McLuhan and his, his influences. Um, and then I was like, well, great. Well, then what happens? So if the basic thesis is like, well, if these media are media, they also mediate the spirit, God's religious practices, mystical experiences, even sort of illuminating uh, language, you know, the sort of mystical poetry or those, those illuminating moments when books become more than just repositories of knowledge, but actually open up and transmit something that kind of magical feeling that, that all readers know, and that's very true in the history of religions, uh, that if, if these physical media can be a can can transmit this religious material well what happens when we subject them to technological criticism and more importantly what happens when they change and so you know for me for the book uh the, the first chapter is really looking at the literary world the world of writing and texts and scrolls the second one is then uh what happens when electricity enters into communication so when we invent the telegraph and or Samuel Morse invents the telegraph in the middle of the 19th century, it's not just that like, oh, there's a new clever communications device. It's that the whole world, the material forces associated with electricity and electromagnetism cross with human communication. And so when that gets spiritualized, that's a new thing. We need new tools, new media understandings of how these new technologies change the religious and, and occult dimension of, write, of writing of earlier forms of, of communication technology. So let's just take, keep going forward. Radio, television, ba da 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 and then up into the, into the computer. So that was the sort of overall historical you know, framework. And uh, one of the things that I noticed uh, is, is the pattern that when there is, when a new technology of communication enters the scene, starting at the very least with the telegraph, immediately afterwards, there's this explosion of utopian energy. This was going to save the world. We're going to understand one another. We're going to be able to uh, transform education. And you see this boom, you know, radio, boom, television, boom, you know. And so from that historical point of view, like I, I was ready for techno utopian hype because it just kind of goes along with the territory where there's a new, a new media opens up spaces of novelty, of undetermined of, of uh, non-striated possibilities. And so of course, some of them are going, you get to see the latent utopianism and the hopes that people still have. So you could watch that. And I was sort of watching that unfold in the 1990s, specifically with computers. And then I went in and, and looked at more contemporary at the time, sort of subfields of the, the kind of new technology, mystical space. So I looked at UFOs, I looked at, the me metaphor of magic in computer games and in hacking and why magic is such a good metaphor for computer space. And then at the end, I looked at some of the ap apocalyptic and millennialist implications, both the sort of hopes for a guy in mind and a transformed global consciousness, as well as the dark side or the dystopian or the paranoid side of that, where suddenly we're inside of some 
you know, uh, demonic uh, uh, antichrist system where everything is controlled. And, and uh, so it's like two sides of the same coin. And, you know, that that really it's, you know, and all that stuff is still here. In fact, in some ways, it's even more visible. Um, so I was able to tap into, I think, abiding dreams and potentials and actual forces that, you know, continue. So it, it was it's surprisingly undated, even though there's nothing about social media. You know, there's nothing about social media or stuff that we would recognize and all and. Uh, so it's it's it, it it was a really interesting ride. The title, though, I must say, is sort of intentional, intentionally ambiguous, in the sense that I've had people go, "Is that a disease?" And I'm like, "Yeah, in some ways it is. It's like an old problem, the Gnostic problem, the dualist problem, in the sense of you know that's one of the ways that Gnosticism has historically functioned in religious discourse is is as a signifier for a radical Manichaean dualism of body and soul or earth and and the alien god and that's often how it's been used sort of in a in a derogatory way as opposed to the more complex form of dualism that orthodox Christianity rep represents so in some ways i'm saying yeah technology actually brings back that really hardcore spirit versus body, uh, information versus matter kinds of thinking that will also have a spiritual or mythological effect. And so when like the Matrix movie came out after I wrote my book, I was like, ding, you know, it was like, here you go, kids. And so then I, my next afterward, I'm like, look at the Matrix. See, I wasn't just like being a goofball. Because when I wrote this book, I, most of the people I know uh, were, who were around me at the time in the 90s were like, I don't know, man, that might not really, I don't know what you're doing there. That sounds a little, a little bit weird, but I, I, you know, as I said, it was a bit of a transmission. So I kind of had to go forward with that. So on the one hand, technosis is sort of a warning about the way that technology and digital technology in particular kind of erodes the culture of matter and it erodes embodiment, erodes the sense of relationality of, of being embedded in an environment and stuff, all of which I think is pretty obvious and, and true and widely recognized. But at the same time, I know that gnosis is a very ambivalent term and that if we are gonna talk about mystical experience as something that's part of the world, part of human possibility, part of culture, even if we don't can't quite define what it is, and maybe mysticism isn't the right word, maybe a cult is better, maybe illumination. I mean, all of these words are only going to be partial or going east, you know, in the traditions I've learned, you know, Satori or Kensho, or, you know, there's other terms for this kind of possibility that we ca ca carry within us. And my approach has always been to very to be very radically open to those kinds of possibilities in a way that. Uh, limits my own pessimism, my own criticality, and, and cr hopefully creates a certain kind of generosity towards the possibilities of religious experience, even when they're bizarre, uh, or, or th they end up being pathological, there's something in there. So I'm also kind of open to what does it mean? What is that Gnostic call? And particularly, and then maybe this is the final thing I'll, I'll say, is that in one way, what Technosis was doing beyond the story about media machines and popular mythology was it was reminding everyone that we have never been modern, that the whether you call it enchantment or you call it religion or you call it a desire for gnosis or desire for um, transcendence, that those elements of the human being, or at least in the West, that we can get in a conversation about whether they're universal or not, that's not really the point. They don't go away with the rise of science and technology and capitalism and industry and modern technology. They just don't. And scholars will look at this, it's totally clear. The whole idea that the modernity is about disenchantment is only one part of the story. And the whole story is much richer and more complex than that. So in a way, I was just saying, look, if there was going to be a vehicle of rationality, bureaucracy, uh, algorithmic control that was going to avoid enchantment, it was going to be these technologies, because obviously they're products of reason, the products of modernity, the products of industrial uh, capacity and, and education, but they're not. In fact, they're crazy. 
So it's like, there's no way out of wrestling with gods and myths and, and spiritual longings. They just get translated, masked, uh, repressed, break out again, you know, and I'm a, I'm a enlightenment guy in a lot of ways. I really, I, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of criticality. I'm a fan of history. I'm a fan of understanding things uh, analytically, but I also recognize there's a limit there. And so I, I wanted to kind of write on the edge of that limit in a way that made the book, not just a critical book, but a book that had sort of seeds of some of these um, enigmas in them, in it. So it's like you kind of pick it up a little bit. So it's also more like, um, like I absorbed some of the memes and allowed them to kind of live their own lives through the text in a way that makes it more enchanting. Just as a writer, I like to do, but I think it's actually a, a more honest way to be a critic in a lot of ways as well. And I think that's partly why people like it is that there's a sense of, uh, there's still a sense of mystery in it, even if it's mostly critical and and analytic thank you so so much for this i often john knows this i often tell my students that according to me at least good scholarship is a scholarship that is clear not only in what it wants to say but what it wants to do right and embraces so to speak the performative effects even perlocutionary effects and you know what emotions we want to trigger and you were so clear on this and you really um i really appreciate it you know you're being so clear with you know with this particular point john do you want to stop in do you have any questions you know about technosis i know you're a fan of the book <laughs> I am. I do have questions. Um, Dr. Davis, first, it's just delightful to have you um, visiting uh, virtually and be part of this conversation. So thank you. Um, so as we sort of touched on, um, I'm solidly millennial, born uh, 1989. And I vaguely have memories of uh, a time before the internet. I have, me I have memories of dial up and uh, what that what that looked like in my own uh, life trajectory. But I'm curious, um, you know, there's this sort of nostalgia for people my generation and younger of, of this era, this uh, techno utopian era, movies like uh, Johnny Mnemonic and Hackers and then The Matrix. Um, and so I'm just curious, what do you think is important from this moment in time when you wrote Technosis for younger generations to know about? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I, I, don't, have an, I don't have a set answer because for me, it is an enigma in the sense that I, I, my, you know, especially as, you know, as one ages, you start to kind of recognize, I think it's easier to recognize the way that you're general, generationally located because of how, how like my, I'll speak for me, my sensibility is increasingly anachronistic. And then you start to realize, oh, that's what this sensibility is. So for me, I am the last gener, I am in the last generation in the developed world of the analog. So I call th that feeling, I call it the analog sunset, where I grew up TV, you know, none of this stuff. And then I watched it grow. And I re can remember early encounters with computers because of my father at work and da, da, da. And it's a whole, it's a very rich part of my life. And I was always very aware of them, very aware of what was going on, that there was something new here, that, that this would needed to be paying attention to. And at the same time, I'm also a very analog guy, you know, hence all the vinyl, you know, and I still, so I'm in that, and I'm very aware that that, that sensibility conditions my experience. And I think it also conditioned the nine, 90s culture, because in a way, what you're looking at with 90s culture is another version of what I had talked about a moment ago, which is really the first time that I, I won't say, not mainstream, but really kind of subculture at large encountered the novelty and the actual you know uh communicational potentials but also the sort of fantasy space of the digital as a distinctly new development in the history of media technology with its own sensibility its own qualities that are in contrast to the analog and one way of thinking about that time period is that you know, this, the counterculture never goes away. The counterculture in the, from the 60s, let's say to the mid 70s, sort of hits a lot of, it runs aground and it's not gonna be the revolution. It's not gonna be, we are all gonna transform the world. But what happens is it doesn't just sell out and go into 1980s Wall Street, 
conservatism and Reaganism. What it does is it goes underground and it breaks apart into all of these subcultures. So then you get these sort of subcultures and undergrounds and punk rock and the Church of the Subgenius and, you know, the beginnings of, of indie rock and industrial culture and gothic culture, you know, all these weirdos, anarchists, psychedelics don't go away. The Grateful Dead is very popular. You know, it's, so you have all these undergrounds. And then in the late 80s and the early 90s, they discover the digital. And so they're able to bring in this novelty, creativity, sense of edginess, but also they recognize how incredibly powerful this space is. And they have the naivete to not consider all of the consequences, not think about how this might actually work out in a world of advanced extractive capitalism. They can away afford their naivete, whatever that means. And I think part of the difficulty, and so I personally wrestled, so this was sort of my time, like my, my 60s was the early to mid 90s before the web really took off and started to go, you know, it's just that period was really wonderful, very interesting time culturally, whatever. But I'm still wrestling with it. And like other people, other thoughtful people in my generation are wrestling with it because there is a kind of naivete in it that makes it a little tough to, to just sort of get behind. And so you're not really sure what to do with it. Is it like, oh, wow, they were lucky them. They got to be naive and enjoy all the goofiness and not have to, you know, deal with social uh, media mobs or advanced, you know, all, all these kind of bummers that are lying ahead in history. So it had, there is that kind of issue uh, of it, but you know, I still have, you know, I still am dumb enough to have faith in human creative capacities and the ability, especially of, of smaller groups, maybe even more lo half, partly localized offline groups to be sites of creative cultural generation and the development of new forms of sociality, et cetera. So I, I think that for all their flaws, all experiments in novel human relationship are interesting and valuable and potentially inspiring. And these are as well. And also the way in which a lot of things that we're dealing with are still, we haven't really escaped some of those models. It's like, um, you know, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna recognize that how, whatever you think about Burning Man at this point, whatever mixture of kind of boredom and mockery and sort of, uh, you know, enjoyment, whatever it is, that, that, that obviously crystallized something very important. And I'm, like a lot of historians, I think that a lot goes on in the origins of things. And in a way, it's kind of like, I, sometimes I feel it's like the, the working myth of a lot of, a lot of historians, or at least certain kinds of historians, where you're like, it's really important to know what are the circumstances where the things begin. And so a lot of things begin in the 90s. And, and so it feels to me like it's important to go back. And, and, and then the third reason, or third, I don't know, the, uh, another reason is that, I don't know about you, but I find myself uh, very disoriented and um, uh, destabilized by you know, transformative forces in history and the undermining of, of conventional narratives, identity positions, et cetera, et cetera. So for one way that I have always dealt with that is to turn to history, not as a model or not even as necessarily a guide to what is gonna go wrong. It might not actually tell you very much about your particular condition, but it does provide a sense of continuity and for lack of a better term, ancestry. So when I, am, when I do studies of 1950s Bohemians, I'm not just understanding their social context or historical context. I'm actually discovering in some ways ancestors, even if they're terribly flawed and make terrible mistakes that I can, I can be very critical of. And I know that that's not, that kind of generosity to the past is less the um, style these days. Uh, but it's one that I have always held to. And so it, along those lines, if you're interested in technoculture, and in some sense, we're all embedded in technoculture now, whatever that means, then these, um, 
these early progenitors, I think, are really key, you know, in science fiction, in the actual technologies, in the forms of, of, of socializing that occurred on places like the well, in the kind of free space of anarchism. I mean, my, my, the, best year, the best year I had on the internet was 1994, you know, so it was dial up, no web. And the reason I say it was then is because it was just a community of weirdos and heads and intellectuals and Deleuzians and anarchists and pagans. And, you know, and we were doing like, you know, uh, role playing text based role playing games, but people weren't playing games. They were like just inventing sort of theoretical identity possibility. So there was this sense, again, of that underground energy of potential that entered into the digital environment and made a lot of really interesting things happen and that in various ways got crushed, got assimilated, became a veneer, you know, it, it, it just, it didn't make it, didn't work, you know, and I had, I had Luddite friends at the time who were saying, don't do it, because a lot of people who were making zines and who were underground were like going, oh, the computer's great and bulletin boards and we're talking with our friends across the planet and they're like, don't do it, don't do it, and I can kind of see their point too, so it's, so watching that transition, I, I think, is still a very, um, you know, inspiring uh, uh, mode as well. Thank you so much, Eric. So one of the things that these Zoologies events um, allow is asking kind of personal questions to our uh, guests. Uh, so Thomas from the audience asks, Eric, you once said that Technosis was a young man book. What does that mean? And do you still think that's true? Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know what I meant at the time. Uh, I would guess that I meant that I was driven by certain ambitions and certain quantities of energy that enabled me to, to just go for it. Like once I decided I was going to do this, you know, the situation was that I, I was also, you know, I could have totally gone to grad school, Ivy League, liked theory, good communicator. And I just said, nah, didn't want to do it. So I went to New York and became a freelance writer, mostly writing about music and at, for whatever. And, and then, but one of the most important transmissions I got at Yale, and it's important that it was at Yale because Yale was the home of two related, but not, not in some ways dissimilar forces. One, which was, it was the ground bed of deconstruction and theory in the United States. And that this was sort of an, I was coming in at a slightly advanced stage of it, but it meant I was exposed to a lot of French thought in particular at that time, Baudrillard. And I remember, I can remember the, the art, um, I went to an art school party and I remember there was a TA that I had, it was kind of a cool hipster diet, he had a, like a leather jacket. And I remember him literally pulling out a copy of the semiotext Baudrillard simulations book, like it was some kind of secret, you know, pornography or something like, ah, have you read this? You know, so I discovered this very bleak techno and analytic picture of the world where, you know, Marxism runs into some kind of weird metaphysical void and, and there's a world of simulations without origins and, you know, this kind of space and at the same time i was also a phil dick fan so like that started to happen so there was a connection there between like phil dick world and this kind of simulation world but there was a third element and that was that yale was also the home of of harold bloom and one of harold bloom's one of his many remarkable critical facilities was the articulate the re-articulation of gnosis and gnostic tradition in a literary rather than religious or occult mode. And I was very influenced by this and started to read early Gnostic literature and started to think about Gnosis in terms of literature. So there's this Phil Dick, postmodern Gnostic cluster of effects. And then I wrote about him in, 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 uh, in, in my thesis in 88. So I came into pop culture with this stuff already behind me. And I just noticed as I was being a pop culture writer that there were like little chunks of uh, these crossovers of technology or pop culture technology and religion just everywhere. But nobody really knew what to do with them. And most pop critics don't like religion. They don't think about it. So I just started to mentally and literally collect this stuff, whether it was in the history books I was reading or 
uh, contemporary technoculture or ufology or the television or internet, whatever. I just started to collect all the stuff. And after a certain point, it became clear that there was a larger project here. And then once I, I did it, I was kind of, you know, obsessed or driven and I was kind of mad with it. And I just did it all the time for years. And I, you know, I literally like I hurt my arms. It was just crazy. So I had a certain kind of energy and a certain kind of ambition and a chip on my shoulder. Like I wanted to like, yeah, this weird stuff is legitimate. <laughs> you know, psychedelics is legitimate, man. Cause like, you know, at, right now it's boring to be like, oh, I'm a, I'm a psychedelic journalist. I'm writing about the new psychedelic Renaissance. Like, ho hum. But believe me, in the 1990s, nobody was doing this. It was it was alienating, you know, and uh, in a way it was like being a freak in the 90s as a writer was um, it was kind of like my identity position because I grew up in the first wave of identity politics. So Yale was super identity politics. The Village Voice, which was the main place I worked, super identity politics. So there's like queer politics, black what now we call Latinx, but wasn't called Latinx back then. You know, it, it was really like part of the zone, which I was totally comfortable around. I really enjoyed, but I enjoyed it because it let me be weird. Like, I'm not going to be like, I'm going to like, this stuff is my stuff it, it, or is my identity in a weird way. Although I'm, it's not like me exactly, but it's like the stuff I'm representing, the people I'm speaking for, the positions that I want to be to affirm. So there was kind of that energy too. Like I'm going to like bring all this crazy stuff and then, and show you how relevant it is across a big chunk of time. Um, so, so anyway, that way I would say it was a, it was a young, a young man's book. When I look at it now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy with it. Like I can, I can see, you know, some elements that I would change that I would be a little more sober about a little bit less pokey, you know, I like to poke people. And so I was like poking people a lot. And now I don't, I try not to do that very much. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it, 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 it very much comes from that sort of energy and that kind of enthusiasm, like that almost in the literal sense of, of enthusiasm at that time. Fantastic. Joelle, do you have any other questions? I do. Um, I guess I'm I'm really uh, in love with this uh, description that you have of technology in technosis. Uh, you say it's neither a devil nor an angel, but then you very quickly say it's not a neutral tool either. And I find often in conversations, even nowadays about technology, people always go, oh, well, it's not good or bad, but it's a, it's a tool. And you say, no, it's not a neutral tool. It's actually a trickster. Um, and I just, I love that framing. I think it's really useful. And so I'm curious, like, since writing this, there's a lot of trickery afoot on the on the internet and in other technology and i'm curious where you see this maybe most forcefully and i might tie a question actually from the sure. audience that i think it's linked uh, could be linked to this it's from ted uh one of my big takeaways from technosis was something you said about how the magical approach to semiotics can help us navigate the postmodern world where are you with how magic, where you, sorry, where are you at with how magical traditions can be a resource for our contemporary problems? So this might be tied, you know. Yeah, with, no, it's with, good. I think, I think I'll think i actually go from that question, from Ted's question sort of back. Um, yeah, I think that the, the magical semiotics connection is an in, incredibly important key to understand uh, aspects of modern or our contemporary uh, situation in terms of how images, myths, desires, and affect uh, are, uh, you could say controlled, you could say stimulated, you could say organized um, with an attention to the depth of the subject in a way that more rational or even ideological approaches miss that there is something in us whether you want to invoke uh, an you know an impossible thinker like Jung that you can't talk about anymore uh, even though there's some good ideas there or just a more uh, a, a more open-ended sense of the person that there are aspects where imagination desire fear and something like uh, the technical array of symbolism cohere in a way that's very powerful. And, and, you know, that advertising, 
is sometimes aware of this. Sometimes it just sort of stumbles into it. It becomes part of advertising and that now it's much, it's part of world creation of the multiplication of worldviews that is being aided and abetted um, by the internet and the breakdown of mainstream media and a lot of these other forces that we're all familiar with. Um, so the question then is becoming aware of how symbols, the body, imagination, and affect combine is to my mind a key way of navigating the condition that we're in, both in terms of trying to open up the space of, of uh, freedom, if, uh, to use a, another now challenging term that I, I still have fondness for, or at least to open up a space of not complete, non-complete capitulation, or what Philip K. Dick called balking, like the ability to pull out, is to be aware of how that that is worked and how it's working on you and how it's working in the society in general, how the black magicians are afoot in a, to use this, the, we know what Isabel Strangers calls this, you know, the sorcery of capital, that those are not mere metaphors. The part of what we're talking about here is something like sorcery and we are compelled by it. And in some ways we can't get out of the, we're part of the pact that was made long ago and we're just doing our best to stay awake and stay human and avoid the, the worst potentials that exist now. But the, posit the more positive way of framing that is that these tools are also aspects of world creation. And whether they can happen on a, a large scale, merely through the internet or through media, I'm not so clear about because I have some questions about how things work when they hit that level of scale. But in terms of revitalizing communities, in terms of navigating fear and navigating paranoia, that, that those kinds of tools can be very effective for ways to find, to, for people to find themselves, to move through this space, partly by creating their own narrative, not so much individually, but kind of collectively as you move forward. So here's, here's what I mean. Like, um, it may be the case that divination tools like the tarot or astrology are total bullshit in the sense that they are, that whatever coherence they have is merely a feature of our capacity to recognize and, or invent pattern where we're really just confronting the noise of, of a meaningless universe. I'll, I'll keep that out there as a possibility. But from the inside, even if it's just kind of an invention, the, the kind of um, affirmation, experimentalism, and creativity that's involved in picking up a divination system as a mechanism for moving through the chaos and confusion of the world, that has obvious pragmatic effects to my mind. It can go south, you can become deluded, you can go paranoid. There's a lot of, there's dangers on this path. But the capacity to, in a sense, from your own material, spill forward using magical means as a way of guiding or shaping patterns of meaning, and it, particularly of relating to others, because in all, any of these paths, it's, you're, in, you're in community when you're doing it, virtual or, or, or real. So I think there's a space for that. Uh, not just a space for it, it's actually kind of, kind of important. And that the, the gods, if you will, that are animated through our actions, our imaginations, our media, um, you know, have, uh, uh, they illuminate, they open up dimensions and possibilities that their mere denial or dismissal doesn't really, you know, uh, account for. Um, so uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, one way of approaching that answer, I know, I think there's a lot more to say about that. Um, I always, we, it, as things get more contemporary, I feel a little bit more tongue-tied because at, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm, in, I'm being trying to be honest and admitting my confusion about a lot of things and my inability to come up with the kind of maps that make sense that I used to have, and rather than trying to sort of invent one that sounds good, like to really acknowledge that I. Uh, you know, in some ways, I'm deeply confused uh, and not sure about the value of particular 
approaches or discourses or texts or et cetera, et cetera. Um, on, the on the question of the trickster though, I think that is a really key element, at least a key element to my approach, um, which is again, don't polarize, don't, uh, don't become Manichaean, don't binarize, which is what we see all around us, evil, good, all those divisions. That's an, always an imaginal possibility. It's very easy to, to get into because it, it clar it's clarifying uh, and not entirely wrong in many circumstances. You know, there's some truth in that kind of approach. But instead, let's trumpet, as you know, we talked about before we, we started this session, ambiguity, complexity, nuance well then what do you get with something that is capable of, of great evil but also some pretty good stuff well you get like a trickster and the sense of and i don't mean a particular you know uh, character in a mythological cycle that has been labeled a trickster which in many ways is kind of a western intellectual invention the trickster as something that explains coyote in 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 native america and loki and scandinavia and elegua and west africa you know it's like well you know uh, maybe maybe yes maybe no but it's a great figure for technology because in a way it's the most current of the archetypes it's like yeah throw it at me i can i can go forward like the other kind of archetypes like, the great mother the wise old man you're like yeah i don't know I don't know if those really have much play right now, but the trickster definitely has some play. And like you say, we're getting into like very scary territory now where, you know, just thinking about deep fakes or thinking about how uh, AI like GPT-3 will be able to, you know, just produce coherent BS and have that be directed in all sorts of ways to, as a, a way of further destabilizing the information system and knowing that there are many agents that are actively invested in that destabilization. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, that's where, you, you know, it's not just that these are mere effects of a certain kind of complexity mixed with the venality of capitalism, were it only that, but it is also a field of active you know, undermining and subterfuge and hacking and pranking and all sorts of um, actively destructive approaches to the communication space. So in a way, you know, we're long past utopias about communication, but it's, we still seem really short on the awareness that we're in. And I, I guess we, when I'm saying this, I mean it a, a little bit more on a personal level that you know, when, when you're moving from your physical environment to the computer and you're entering into these spaces, you're entering into a, you know, a realm of, of sorcery, manipulation, uncorked, destructive affect, all sorts of stuff, along with cool things and your friends and the people you love, whatever. But that there's, a, there's still a, a, a kind of contemporary naivete that doesn't have the charm of utopianism, but has a kind of uh, lack of self-awareness as people integrate these you know, technologies. And it gets very difficult because then you're like talking about masses of people and what kind of education and expectations they have and how they're manipulated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I don't quite ascribe to the degree of kind of, uh, I don't want to say mind control, but sort of manipulation effects that some critics like Tristan Harris have of the way in which we've been gamed by social media and the internet in order to just, you know, uh, you know, basically control our desires and, and, and um, uh, you know, manipulate us to that degree. It, it still see, feels to me like there's some room for something like freedom or opening within that. Maybe that's my uh, old, you know, fuzzy analog self, you know, holding on uh, for dear life. Uh, but, uh, but at the very least, understanding that part of what we're navigating is an imaginal space within which there are 
dark and manipulative forces that are using our own fears and our own imaginations in order to produce worlds. And some of it's happening unconsciously and some of it's ha happening in a manipulated way. And we never really know which one it is. Uh, you know, I think we had early, earlier mentioned the example of QAnon and QAnon is a wonderful example of this. When you look at the reality of how many people got sucked into that worldview, which if you were someone like me, you're like, yeah, okay, whatever. I've seen, I've been tracking conspiracy theories since I was a wee lad. Like there's nothing in this that is particularly fresh. And yet because of media conditions and because of political conditions, there was a lot of, um, you know, there were a lot more opportunities to spread and intensify and uh, uh, support this worldview. So once I was caught with the possibility, hey, maybe something's going on here, there was so much positive feedback that could maintain my worldview as I started to spill and go ever deeper into the connections, some of which are true, some of which are real, and some of which are allegorically true, meaning that they are not true as literal features, but they're pretty, they're pretty right on, I would say, on a more poetic, critical uh, perspective about some of the rot in the society. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a clear line. It's like the technology thing. It's not, you can't just say, oh, over there is conspiracy theory. We could miss that. Not at all. Not at all. But it's more about how does it actually work and how do people not find their way back to any kind of consensus. And uh, so to my mind, you can look at all of that QAnon effect in part as an example of magical semiotics or the mytho or dark mythopoesis gone awry or gone wayward, uh, intoxicated with its own power as it, as it absorbs souls. Uh, into its narrative framework, and that that kind of mythopoetic thinking is and should be part of analysis. It's not like it's just over there. It's actually you have to get good at that as another mode within which you approach the world. You don't stay there all the time. You don't get stuck there all the time. But you also don't just stay in some kind of sociology and analysis. Because I read so much stuff about QAnon that was critical, or you know, journalism accounts and academic accounts. And almost all of them ha have this own this other kind of naivete, which is a sort of naive faith in the language of kind of rational sociology. Like, yeah, we'll just we'll we'll get this back to the analytic terms that we can understand in terms of social forces and ideology and uh, media penetration and and like that's going to get you anything. It's like no, it's worse than that. We are in a world where for lack of a better term, magical forces are part of history. And the older disenchantment idea of modernity, that the way you deal with the demons of the dark is to analyze and disenchant them. Well, we tried that. We did. We really, the West really tried to do that. Didn't do a very good job. And now we're like, in a way, kind of, uh, we don't have the right tools to deal with this. And so for me, this requires a kind of, um, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, not ambidextrous, uh, amphibian approach. You know, Huxley used the model of the amphibian, is that we have to be able to kind of lean into the surreal and recognize how that dynamic works and then still be able to come back, analyze, create, uh, you know, uh, clear statements, attempt to communicate and elucidate differences and perspectives. Um, but that, that that facilitation between worlds is really key because most, a lot of people don't do that and they get lost. And, you know, here, cue up mini discussion about the contemporary psychedelic renaissance. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, look, you, you thought QAnon was bad. Those, most of the QAnon people were not smoking 5-MeO, DMT in a therapist's office or taking ayahuasca or change. Some of them did. And we, that was a whole part of it was how did all so many psychedelic people get sucked into it, which is a good sign of what lies ahead when far more people probably, you know, we don't know with the, how the legal thing's going to work out, but pretty likely that there's going to be this sort of mass uh, explosion of people having experiences often with guides who are themselves very unfamiliar, uh, who will become inflated, will manipulate, will abuse 
Uh, and so we're just turning up the volume on the imaginal and the mythopoetics and the potential irrationality associated with those realms. And if we look candidly at the history of psychedelics in the West, you know, it's not a, it's not a glowing, <laughs> it's not quite as glowing as the hypesters want to want you to think in terms of what kind of effects it has on individuals, on cultures and perspectives. So uh, yeah, in that sense, I think these amphibian skills um, it, 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 and they almost require like, I think, I think a lot of people who are intellectual or rational or been trained in, in analytic methods, trained in the sciences, they recognize there's, that there's a recognition that there's something in these a-rational realms and experiences that is of value and more so not even just of value but of importance in how the world works and may even be increasing in their importance but how to re uh remap that relationship i think is really up in the air and that a lot of the interesting thinking going on now has to do with how do you move in and out of that space and maybe let go of some of the older disenchantment ideas about the function of reason in relationship to a rational experience, to use these kind of loaded terms. I'm, I'm sorry the level of generality I'm speaking, but it, it makes sense at the time, at right now that we're navigating new ways. And that's part of what technosis, part of my whole work has been trying to do that. How do you honor and respect this other realm, but keep your feet on the ground? and model a certain kind of openness and a certain kind of criticality. So that even in the most far out spaces, there's some of that rational skepticism keeping you uh, oriented. And at the same time, even in the, in the depths of your analysis, you recognize that the gods are afoot. Thank you so, so much for this. It was rich. I wish we had three hours actually to, to unpack a, a few of the things that you uh, mentioned. So we have five minutes left and there are a number of questions about technosis today among our audience. Um, for example, our colleague and friend, Christian Greer uh, asks us about the green dimension of technosis, Nancy, uh, about the interplay between technosis and the economic system and an anonymous about politics and a number of others, but Ferdinando asks about the future, actually. So I might want to end with this question. Dr. Davis, at this point in time, playing a donning your prophet hat, how would you assess the world situation, how technology is affecting humans, and where are heading toward? We are heading towards. And um, thank you. Small question yeah. to end. What's that? A small question. Yeah, I, and I, <laughs> I, mean, I have to I have to admit I, I really I kind of half punt on these future questions, partly because I'm just that's not really the way my mind works. Like I and and part of it though, to be more honest, is that it's when I try to think about the future, and I emphasize the verb or you know, coherently offer a model, a picture, that my pessimism comes to the fore with great alacrity and um, vehemence. And yet there's another part of what, what I see that, I, that I'm doing in the world that in a way is not about simply voicing a pessimistic view, which isn't gonna surprise anybody at this point. There's nothing I could say, oh, that's a new, that's a new twist on how, you know, how deep in the hole we are. You know, and so I, part of my reticence more recently is just recognizing that um, it's too big for me to, to come up with without just, or uh, without just relying on kind of pessimistic models that, that exist there. That said, um, that what we mean by, I mean, I think that that we're we really are kind of going post-human and transhuman. And I'm not going to go too much in what I mean by that, but I just mean the technological and environmental conditions are such that the the existing form of human subjectivity is being pressured and stressed to an extraordinary degree, and that that is inevitably going to produce incredible reactionary forces. It's also going to produce 
what we see now, which is a certain kind of um, last ditch uh, neoliberal capital mutant, you know, ex metaverse uh, leap into the future kind of last gasp kind of approach. Um, and then also a corresponding melancholy and grief about the overwhelming, you know, how could it not be the end of time sort of conjunction of this technological undermining of embeddedness and embodiment in some kind of human current of mammalian uh, expression going back a million, couple million years. The, the fact that this is happening technologically and the, the climate change is happening, I mean, it's like, you know, how could, how could this not be the end of days? You know, it'd be, because if you imagine just for a moment right now, okay, guys, no climate, climate's not a problem. It's not happening. Boosh, it's gone. No problem. Everything's groovy. Think about how terrifying everything still is. Terrifying. So the, de the destabilization is so extraordinary that to my mind, just if we can just keep like communicating and, and loving each other and being able to have sense making operations at all, where it's a win because it's that dire or difficult to transform in relationship to that. Personally, I am mostly focusing on recognizing where I've come from, appreciating what I have had the opportunity to and mourning the loss of things and to being strong in facing the dark, that the, the the task, whether you want it or not, is to be able to confront your own confusion, the, the terror of the very real forces that are you know, actively undermining coherence, the uh, reality of climate change, and the way in which the cat is out of the bag with, with you know, capitalist technology. Maybe there's a kind of breaking point that allows something genuinely new to happen. But to my mind, anything that's genuinely new is going to intensify the reactionary forces that are clearly rampant around the world. And I don't even know, like maybe the only way human beings face the climate change ahead is through um, some kind of green fascist totalitarianism. That might be the case. And anything else we try, is just not gonna work. I don't know that. And I'm willing to think about it though, and to be to take on the horror and disgust that that possibility makes in me that I also resist and, and re I'm not going to embrace. But I think we're at a place where before we even prognosticate about where things are going, that we're in like a narrow channel individually and collectively, particularly close collectively, friend networks, departments, reading groups, discord communities, you know, things where there's a little bit more space is to just up our capacity to take on the, the scary, hard, confusing, depressing, mournful aspects of existence so that we, in a sense, toughen up or be able to be like, yeah, that's part of what's going on. You know, it's part of what happens. Like when war happens, you know, now we're all, we all have a very clear, crystal clear imagination of war it's unfortunate it has to happen with Ukraine and it didn't happen with Iraq, but here we are, that everybody's got that in your mind. Like the realities of war, they just change all the pictures and suddenly, yeah, you can't be, you know, you, don't, you can't collapse when you see the dead kid. You just got to keep on going. And in a way, we got some of that kind of stuff coming up one way or another and that we have the ability and there are tools and there are ways that our, our, our loves and our imaginations and dreams can come together with a kind of um, sober embrace of our uh, condition. So it's really, that's more what I, I come from when I think about the future rather than a picture of how it's going to go is more the way that the future is already demanding something from us that is difficult but valuable and better than wallowing and merely pointing fingers and becoming bitter and uh, just submitting to despair and all, you know, that there is a way of growing being and more being really in relationship to uh, all the chickens coming home to roost.
Thank you so, so much. There are a number of excellent questions from our amazing audience that I can't ask you now, but please be assured uh, that we will uh, forward your question to Dr. Davis uh, by email, because I think it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you, Eric and Joelle, for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. And thank you all for having been with us. If you want to hear more from Dr. Davies on, about his work, uh, please follow the Burning Shores website. And I also would like to mention a coming online conference on the Chakruna Institute, the Religion and Psychedelics Forum that Dr. Davies helped organizing and whose website I think you can find in the chat box right now. Thank you all for having been with us, for your support to the Nosiology series throughout this academic year. I hope to see you next year, finger crossed, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you, bye. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.